اعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله بارئ الخلائق الاجمعين باعث الانبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبياء حبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا ابي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد ثم الصلاة والسلام على اهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما ولي الله الحجة ابن الحسن صاحب الامر والزمان اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد روحي وارواح العالمين له الفداء ولعنة الله على اعدائهم اجمعين من الاولين والاخرين الى قيام يوم الدين امين رب العالمين اما بعد احبائي yesterday we began with the discussion of exploring the traits that are necessary for us to cultivate within ourselves in order to qualify as mu'minin traits that we need to cultivate within ourselves in order to attain perfection traits that we need to cultivate within ourselves in order to be successful in the dunya as well as the akhirah for in essence within the quran allah azza wa jal has planned out and has put forward for us those aspects that are necessary for self development see amir al mu'minin ali ibn abi talib salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayh allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ala muhammad says in one of his traditions just to add that urgency and that importance in the, in the discussions that we are engaged in because a lot of these in essence are part of motivational talks and there is no better entity that you can find in this earth to motivate you and to develop you to be the perfect being outside of the quran and ahlul bayt see the hadith of amir al-mu'minin he says we were born free and hence we should live as free men don't be a slave to anybody don't be a slave to yourself or to your passions or to your desires and when you live as a free man the idea is that you live a life of a legacy you live a life where you live behind you leave behind the legacy and the only way that can be done is when you have a personality that is an outstanding personality you have a magnificent aura that surrounds your being in the way you carry yourself and in the way you talk with others and the way you present yourself and you leave a mark towards the goodness of humanity and this mark is what elevates you to the highest level of success not only in the dunya but as well as in the akhirah where do you find these traits i know we have dua which is in narrated by imam zainul abidin salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayh allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ala muhammad and i believe this is the dua to be recited on the first night of shahrul ramadan when the moon is sighted or regardless even if the moon is not sighted you've passed the 30 days yani baad shahrul ramadan is come in on the first night muhim first night of shahrul ramadan in part of the dua imagine from all the things you could ask for and we are on the footsteps of laylatul qadr we are on the doorstep rather of laylatul qadr and these are nights of hajat and inshallah we have particular lectures for these but the logical mind or logic would dictate that if you have grand nights that have a direct impact on your destiny you are going to start pre-planning what you want to ask for in your hajat you don't want to come to the mosque and freestyle it and wing it and whatever comes to your head and days later you remember ah, i forgot to ask la the akil the intellectual person pre-plans his time you have got this time from salatul maghrib till salatul fajr 
Part of it you're going to be in the mosque, a part of it you're going to be in the home. What you want to achieve in this night, you plan everything out. And hence, you're able to achieve, inshallah, what you want. In this dua, from all the things that you could ask for in hajat, what comes into your mind if you were to close your eyes and you were told one wish, one hajat that you want to be fulfilled immediately? You close your eyes and you see from all the things that might come across or flash through your mind. Look at what Imam Sajjada says in his dua, he's teaching us. On the first night of Shahrul Ramadan, Ya Allah, to paraphrase the words, help me to not be a useless person in life. Ajeeb. Help me such that I, I'm not a useless person in life. A person, through my character, I leave behind the legacy. Through my actions, I leave behind the legacy. But before action proceeds, character. And hence these traits that we are trying to identify within the Quran are traits that if we embark with the right spirit, not only do we change our own lives, not only do we illuminate our own lives, but we illuminate the lives of those who are around us. Tayyib. Having said this, yesterday, for a quick recap, we looked at Surah Al-Baqarah and the trait that we identified was the trait of Salat where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees and if the ayah is up on the screen or if you're following it on your smartphones or your own copies of the Quran Surah Al-Baqarah verse number 153 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu istainu bis sabri wa salat Inna Allah ma'a sabirin O you who believe Seek inner strength through your Salat. And so, as per yesterday's discussion, we said Salat as an institute, number one, is a source of seeking inner strength and self-empowerment in the face of difficulties that you may face on a daily level. Every day of your life, there is one type of a challenge, one type of challenge or the other that you are facing. And many times the human being feels that I'm limited in my capacity and limited in my resources and I cannot handle that pressure. The term cracking under pressure, giving up in life. La, for the mu'min, these thoughts never cross through his mind because he has understood the institution of Salat and we went on to say that there are two types of people who recite Salat there are those who are condemned in the Quran and those who are praised within the Quran and the summary of this was quality of Salat the quality of the prayers that we uphold the first and most basic step of improving the quality of our Salat is understanding and buckling the translation of Salat as soon as or as long as you know what you are reciting, this is the key to curbing your attention within Salat. You have within the Hadith as well, in regards to the Tafsir of this verse, that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, seek inner strength through Salat, yani the word Salat over here means your five wajib Salat, and in addition to this, there is the nafilah. And in addition to this, there is the salatul layl. But you find hadith from Ahlul Bayt where they come forward and they say that one additional meaning of the word salat is the actual salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Oh. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. For oh. in addition to the daily namaz, the daily salat that we recite, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, seek inner strength by sending blessings on Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. And you probably already know of the numerous benefits that have been narrated for us and the thawab that just comes from reciting salawat. This recitation of salawat, a simple action of the tongue, is one that is an attestation of your relationship with Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. And so long as you are connected with the Thakalain, there is no power on the earth that can overcome you. 
This is a stern reality that we need to acknowledge. You look at these personalities that existed across time, the likes of Kambar, the likes of Muhammad ibn Abu Umair, Muhammad ibn Abu Umair, the companions of the sixth Imam. He lived at a time where he was captured by the government authorities and was tortured on the basis that he was a Shia and he was imprisoned such that he may snitch or they may gain intel on the activities of other Shia. But because of his reliance on Salawat and his deep affiliation and love for Ahlul Bayt, he wouldn't budge. In the books of Tariq, they say that in the prison they would torture him, they would bring planks of wood. You have a plank of wood and within this plank of wood there would be a hundred odd nails that are halfly hammered inside. So half the nail is inside the wooden plank and the other half is protruding. They would put Abu Umair down on his stomach and they would slash him with this on his back. Not one whip, hundred whips. Person could die from a single whip. Muhammad ibn Umair, a hundred whips he would take. And this was not a one-off torture. Daily. Wow. Snitch on your imam. Give us intel about your imam. Muhammad ibn Abu Umair, quiet. What gives you that inner strength? Imagine your mental frame, your, the zone in which you are mentally. You are so staunch such that it overcomes the physical pain that you are experiencing. You have got a full grasp over your mind such that physical pain is of, is of no concern to you. And you see even sometimes in martial arts, you've got a discipline of pain management and how you can mentally be strong such that you are not limited by physical pain. And now we have a strength which is a ghaybi. Do we feel this through the salawat? These are not tales or theories that are untested. You have men who have lived these values. For these small recitations, bas if then with ma'rifah, have a huge impact on our character and on our being. So you find, as we were making in way of summary, that Salat has an impact on us in that it gives us inner strength. A second meaning of the word Salat over here is the regular Salawat that we recite on Ahlul Bayt. And we said yesterday that Salat has a tangible impact on our behavior. You can know whether your Salat has been accepted or not based on your behavior before and after the Salat. Tayyib, if we understand this, you find that there is a second trait that is highlighted in the same verse, Surah Al-Baqarah. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu ista'inu bis sabri wa salat. Seek inner strength by exercising sabr, patience. Patience, I don't want to emphasize too much on patience because inshallah we have a separate lecture for this. But because it is mentioned in the verse for Baraka. Sabr basically to restrain yourself from a reaction. Or sometimes restraining yourself from an action. It can be reactive, it can be proactive. The power of restraining yourself. What connection does this have with inner strength? See, I'll give you a very basic example at the lowest level of sabr. When a person starts attacking you with petty accusations, and you feel the urge inside of you to react back to him or to her. What happens is, in reality, you lower your, you lower your status. Because now you have become as petty as him. And he's accusing you and you come forward with rebuttals. Or when he accuses you, you react with another accusation and he insults you. And you react with another insult. What happens is you have degraded yourself. You've brought yourself to a level just as his. 
Whereas on the other hand, when you practice sabr and you restrain yourself from reacting, you restrain yourself from responding. What happens is you begin to strengthen your soul in that you become immune to the useless opinions of people around you. This is inner strength. You are not concerned with what people have to say about you. And we're talking on a petty level. Doesn't mean that a person becomes arrogant. La at a petty level. That's why you have this very famous saying. A lion does not concern himself with the opinion of the sheep. Let them say what they want until you know you're the lion. For sabr and re practicing restrain actually has the effect of strengthening your character and your personality. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Tayyib. Coming in for today's verse, verse number 172 and 173. So the second character of a mu'min. Look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Are the verses, by the way, on the screen on top? Sa? Yeah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. Just like the way you had the verse that we saw yesterday. Khitab khas. Is a communication that is special for people of a certain level of understanding and a certain level of belief. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu kulu min tayyibatin ma razaknakum washkuru Allah or washkuru lillah in kuntum iyahu ta'abudun. O you who believe, eat from that which is purified, which has been granted to you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the very meanings of the word tayyibat, ya'ani, O you who believe, do not consume food. Let me put it the other way around. O you who believe, consume food that is halal for you. The trait of a mu'min, the trait of a successful person is that he eats that food or consumes that food which is lawful, which is halal for him. Halal food and haram food. We have two categorizations of food that could be halal and food that could be haram. One from a fiqhi technical perspective and one which comes from a spiritual perspective. We look at an example of both of these. An example of consuming food that is haram. Where is the example of this? Or where is the outline for this? The following verse of Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا حَرَّمَ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَيْتَةَ وَالدَّمْ وَلَحْمَ الْخِنْزِيرَ وَمَا أُهِلَّ بِهِ لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ That which has been prohibited, that which has been made haram for you, very generally speaking, the carcass, any meat product that is slaughtered or that is not slaughtered in accordance to the rules of the dhabiha as stipulated by the fiqh is haram to eat. Fish, we have a certain type of seafood that is acceptable to eat and we have certain type of seafood that is not acceptable to eat. Ya Habibi, no matter how much that octopus looks delicious, I have to ask myself, is it halal or haram? So food that we consume, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the mu'min is the one who takes care in issues of halal and haram when it comes to the food that we consume. Inshallah, I think from what I understand over here in Nairobi and pretty much in Kenya, there is absolutely no problem in finding food that is halal. And perhaps most of the meat or the chicken that you consume is probably halal. I don't know, y'all would know better but in the west we have mashakil you have issues 
Even worse, sometimes we have our local lads and local girls who are going abroad to study because they've been in East Africa and suddenly you see a McDonald's and you see that Mac burger and that temptation kicks in. You forget, ya haram, ya halal. And it opens the doors of mashakil, tribulations in the character of the child. And the parent sits back and says, Ajib, I sent him or her to go and get a university education. They can make their life. The guy comes back being a shaitan. The root cause for this is the food. Now a person comes forward and he says, logically speaking, logically speaking, Yani food that is not halal, how can it really have an impact on my spirituality? And then you have food that is prepared by those people who are outside of the Ahl al-Kitab, whether the issue of Najasa comes in or not. And there are thousands of ishkals around them and thousands of arguments. The reality is this in the Quran. You are the food that you consume. See, when you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your worshipping of Allah, the goal behind your worship is the elevation of your soul. Sahih, the elevation of your ruh. However, because of the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us, we are created in the dunya where your soul is restricted to your body. And in essence, your body is the vehicle through which your soul seeks elevation. So the way you treat your body has an impact on your soul. In fact, your elevation of your soul is contingent upon how you treat your body. Salat. Salat is what? Mi'rajul mu'min. We have within the hadith. Salat is the mi'raj of a mu'min. Mi'raj, which type of mi'raj? Mi'raj of the soul. Mi'raj of the ruh. You experience a high level of spirituality. But how do you experience this high level of spirituality with your soul? By the help of your body. Standing in qiyam, you need your body. Going into ruku, you need your body. Going into sajda, you need your body. So you're using your body as a vehicle, as a means for the elevation of your soul. Hajj, the same thing. Hajj is supposed to be spiritually uplifting. But you cannot gain that spiritual upliftment without your body because you need your body to do tawaf you physically need your body to be in mina and to be in arafah every ibadat every aspect of worship that we have it entails us using our body see this is the relationship between the ruh between the soul and the body it entails every aspect of worship entails you using your body such that you may elevate your soul ziyarah to karbala Hadith we have, ziyarat of Karbala, walk to Karbala, suffer under the heat, suffer with your legs and let your legs get swollen in the process. Because why? That pain that you face in the process has an impact on the ruh. So your body has an impact on your soul. And vice versa, your soul has an impact on your body. Which is why if we understand the relationship between our souls and our bodies, and how this is detrimental to our success in the dunya and the akhirah, ha, now we begin to understand the logic as to why Allah Azza wa Jal and the Sharia has put for us boundaries in terms of consuming food that is halal and haram has an impact on us so you find over here coming back to our discussion that the first example of food that is haram is those technical aspects categories of food that is haram fish for example without scales sheep cow chicken that are slaughtered not by way of the biha for example high one category on the other hand Food, for example, prepared or food that becomes najis, prepared by people outside of the Ahlul Kitab. People outside of the Ahlul Kitab, sometimes they prepare food 
which is tahir, and sometimes they prepare food which is najis. The details or tafasil for these are in the big books of fiqh. In any case, this is the first category. Second category is this. The food in itself is not haram. The chicken that you are consuming is not haram. You went and you bought it from a Muslim or from a Shia butcher. Food in itself is halal. There is no problem in that. The problem is with the means through which you earned the money to eat that food. The food in itself is halal. But if the profession in which I am engaged is haram, if the manner in which I am earning my risk is haram, then even the food that I put on the table, even though it meets the conditions of the biha, this is known as a risk that is haram or food that is haram. Morsel of haram food doesn't destroy a person, destroys an entire nasal. An entire lineage. Because the fundamental rule is here. You are what you eat. And as the breadwinner of the house. If you are in that position. Feeding your family. Or even conceiving. You see conception is a big deal in Islam. Parenting doesn't start when the child is born. Parenting starts way, way before that. When you're even thinking about conceiving your child, the duties of parenthood start over there, which is why you have the hadith that the expecting woman always needs to be, for example, in a state of wudu or recite surah al Yusuf and so on and so forth. Why? Because there are these effects on your newborn baby. I remember back in the day, people used to come and say, oh, this is just... Cultural talk, vague talk, la la la. Science has even proved now that the actions of a pregnant woman has an impact on the fetus. There was a university, there was a research done, if I'm not mistaken, University of Berkeley or something of the sort, where a woman who was in the habit of listening to music when she was, uh, when, uh, when she was pregnant, after she gave birth, that same music would have a X type of impact on the newborn child. Science is proving things that Islam had already made clear for us hundreds if not thousands of years ago. For the food that we consume, haram food. I have to see in every profession that we are engaged in, and this is where the importance of fiqh comes in. Sometimes there is again another division. Sometimes the profession is haram to begin with. I decide I want to become a rap star and I want to make it big on MTV and through this I'm going to feed my family and madri shu la riz haram haram habibi there's no way around it or it could be the other way around that my actual profession is halal but within my profession there are fiqhi boundaries as to what to do and what not to do give you by way of example abortion after we have opinions within the maraja <coughs> but after an x amount of time it is haram to perform an abortion after an initial period of time it is haram to perform an abortion in the Janabak, you have studied hard and you're a doctor. You have a woman who is six months pregnant, seven months pregnant. Enter, you're a doctor, she's a doctor. Salam alaikum, doctor sahab, I want to do an abortion. Enter for you in your profession. Is it halal or haram to conduct this abortion or not? And like this, as businessmen, in the fields of business, in the fields of investments, we all have boundaries of what is halal and haram. I could be part of coordinating forward contracts, say for example for wheat from some country, and then become part of a sub-organization that fuels speculation to drop down the price of wheat. And I get a bonus and a commission based on that. Habibi, halal or haram? to think 
I have a credit account with a supplier or with somebody who's buying from me, we have a credit account. And the credit account keeps rolling every month. Ani, without me telling him, I went and increased the price 10%. Rules of tijara, agreement on a price of sale. Halal or haram? Haram food can push you to such an extent it can remove you from the folds of insaniyat. I'll give you an example and we'll open this to question and answer after. Yomul Ashura. You know when they all surrounded Imam al Hussein on the day of Ashura, the war didn't just begin just like that. Yani Ashura you find that there was a proper strategic battle and there were a number of things that happened. You know, from a military perspective, the fact that a band of 72 men and then maybe up to 100 because people started converting along the ways, a group of 100 people hold back an army of 70,000 from the time of Fajr to the time of Asr is remarkable military history world history in the times of wars they have not seen a feat like this the manner in which imam al hussein arranged his army they had three flanks the center flank the right wing and the left wing and the way he arranged the archers and the way he arranged the horsemen and the way they attacked the left wing and then they came to attack the right wing and how they dug a trench behind so that there is no counter attack Allah, Imam al Hussein, warrior of all warriors, commander in chief of all commanders in chief. There is no one who could outsmart Imam al Hussein when it came to military or warfare tactic. At the end of the day, he's the son of Haider al Karrar. In any case, these are all subhanallah topics. But on the day of Ashura, the war didn't start straight away. After Salatul Fajr, Imam al Hussein gave a khutbah. In fact, he gave two khutbahs. And then other companions came and gave khutbahs. And after this khitab happened, there were miracles that also happened. One of the miracles was that a person by the name of Ibn Hawza came and he insulted Imam al Hussein. Imam al Hussein raised his hands in du'as and he said, Ya Allah, if he is wrong, then show the people that he is wrong by sending divine adab on him. At that point in time, Ibn Hawza fell off his horse. His leg was stuck to the straddle. The horse kept running. He hit his head on every chopped tree stump that was there. And because Imam al Hussein had dug a trench and lit it with fire to protect the women and the tents so there is no counter attack, the horse flung Ibn Hawza into the fire. And the enemies are watching this. Mu'jiza in front of them has happened. Baba, don't fight Imam al Hussein. You can see he's a man of God. You can see that he is the third rightly appointed Khalif of Allah. Did it have an impact on them? La. Nothing. Mu'jiza happens in front of you and you're indifferent to that. Baba, how dark must their souls be? Why did they become that dark? Imam al Hussein said to them at one point on the day of Ashura, Do you know why my guidance doesn't have an impact on you? Do you know why when I say things to you, it doesn't sink into your heart? He says, Because your stomachs are filled with food that is haram. It became a barrier and an obstacle to your faculty of akal. You cannot process information anymore. Hence, when it comes to food that is halal and haram, it is always important to understand this relationship between the soul and the body. You are what you eat. What you consume in your body is going to affect your ruh. And in the same way, the way you treat your ruh is going to affect your body. Look at the Maraja, for example, because their nafs is so strong. You have Maraja at the age of 90, 95, memorizing verses of the Quran, fit as a fiddle. And sometimes we come and we see, La, by the age of 90, 95, person is suffering thousands of mental illnesses. 
in any case so the second trait is the trait of consuming food that is halal before we move on we take questions any questions from the uh, from the gen side While the gents are thinking if there's any question from the sister's side. Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Thank you. Oh, two questions. Thank you. <clears throat> question on yesterday's majlis. You mentioned that a person who prays and then does ghibah, he is from the reckless ones. No, I didn't say. Allah said in the Quran. Or those of the sahun. What about those who listen to the ghiba? Is their status the same? See, we clap with two hands. Many times, crime that happens, there's not only a single person responsible for the crime. And even when it comes to oppression, in many cases, there is the oppressor and then there is the person who's willing to be oppressed. What we say is in this particular question over here, if somebody is performing ghibah and I am sitting in that ghibah, you know, sometimes they say ghibah has a sweetness. You know, when you're itching to hear about somebody's shortcoming or somebody's downfall or problems in somebody's house and it gives you a bit of a buzz and a thrill. <laughs> in any case, what they say, if you are actively listening to the ghibah, then yes, you are also party. Sometimes the responsibility is this. If a person is doing a ghiba and you are there, you either try and change the subject in a very polite manner so that you are not party to the ghiba. If you feel you cannot change the subject, then you politely excuse yourself from the majlis. Or if the relationship with the person is such that you are open enough and you are frank enough, you can tell them, listen, mate, this is an on. We cannot be speaking about other people like this. Depending on the relationship, it is there. But at the very minimum, person should take a stance and walk away. If we cannot condemn something as tiny as a ghibah, when are we ever going to have the courage to condemn oppression, which is even at a larger scale? Not to say that a ghibah is something small. But these are traits within us that cultivate a little bit of courage. Good question. Second question that is there from the women's side. <clears throat> Wa alaikum salam. Body is a means to spiritual upliftment. What if the body is physically not able to perform certain acts? Does that restrict elevation of the soul? Absolutely not. Because you find within our fiqh and within the traditions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given every human being the opportunity for their soul to elevate regardless of their physical restrictions, limitations or disabilities. And you find over here in Islam, physical disability is not a barrier to the elevation of the soul. We have this within our hadith. And the example for this is what a person who is not physically fit to stand and pray, what does he do? He sits and prays. Does it mean because he's sitting and praying that his salat has less value than the person who is standing? La. The person who cannot physically walk around the tawaf, he's either carried or in this day and age we have the wheelchair. Does this mean because he's on a wheelchair that his tawaf has less value than the other one? No. The idea is that regardless or in proportion to your physical ability, this is the key word, in proportion, in proportion to your physical ability, the more you strive in the way of Allah, the more your soul is elevated. So disability by no chance is a, or in no way is an impediment or an obstacle to physical elevation. Any other question from the, question from the men's side? La, yesterday we had a question, uh, I will clear this. And then we can perhaps wrap up the majlis. I wanted to talk about shukar, inshallah, maybe tomorrow. <clears throat> we had a question yesterday, the meaning of the word samad from Surah Al-Ikhlas. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. 
قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد what is the meaning of صمد this hadith there are very there are multiple meanings of the word صمد this one I believe and all words of Ahlul Bayt are beautiful but I feel that this one inshallah is going to hit the mark hadith is from su or the hadith is from tafsir nuru thakalain when you say allah samad you have five letters yesterday i said samad yani seen mim dal it's sad mistake sad mim dal when you say allah samad when you actually break up the word it's made up of five letters you have Alif Lam, Alif Lam, Swad, Meem, and Dal. Allahu Samad. Each one of these letters represents a grand attribute of Allah. And this meaning is supposed to flash through our mind when we are reciting Surah Al Ikhlas. Alif, the letter Alif stands for the Inaniyat of Allah. Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. His own attestation of his oneness. The Lamb represents the Uluhiyyah, the Lordship of Allah. Now this is where there's a very beautiful meaning that comes out from the grammar and from the Tajweed. See, when you're reciting the Surah, you say Allahu Samad. You don't say Allahu Al Samad. According to the rules of Tajweed, the Lamb is silent, there is Idgham. And you don't say Allahu as samad You join it together. Allahu samad So the Alif Lam is silent. Perhaps to the listener, he doesn't even realize that there is the letter Alif Lam. When you're listening, you don't know that there is the letter Alif Lam. It is only when you open the book or when you actually look at the word as samad you see Alif Lam. Correct? So the Mufassirin or the Ahlul Bayt come forward and say, and this represents in the manner in which you recognize Allah. Just like the way you cannot hear the Alif Lam. You cannot capture Allah through your five senses. You cannot see him, you cannot smell him, you cannot touch him, you cannot hear him, and definitely you cannot taste him. But you can understand Allah through your aql. So in the same way the alif lam is silent to the physical senses or to the apparent senses. But you acknowledge or you realize its existence when you actually look into it. The same thing with the existence of Allah. You find that there is a great dalala in this. This is the alif lam. Sad denotes that Allah is sadiq truthful in that everything and anything to do with Allah has truth towards it Shias are being persecuted in every corner of the world but when you realize and when you listen to the words of God that there is a savior of mankind who is coming to fill the earth with peace and justice know that the words of Allah are the words of Siddiq much as we may, be, we may be oppressed today, there is a day of justice that is coming. So Saad represents Siddiq in the message of Allah. Much as you suffer or you deny yourself temptations, have faith that there is that divine recompensation waiting for you over there. And it's a compensation that is, has truth behind it, Siddiq. So Saad for Siddiq. Meem for mulk, everything and anything that is in the realm of existence belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And dal means dawam. Dawam meaning Allah's existence is not constrained by time. He's, you cannot even say that God is eternal. God is created eternity. And this is the meaning behind the word Samad from Tafsir Nur Thakalain on the words of Ahlul Bayt. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Oh. Oh.
Do we have time to go over one more character and then tomorrow we move on? Tayyib. We will try and make this quick, insha'Allah. The last character, again, from the same verse of the Quran, Surah Al Baqarah, verse number 172. Look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Ya ayyuhalladina amanu kulu min tayyibatin ma razaknakum. Eat from that food that is halal. This risk that Allah has given you food that is halal. This is one. So trait number two. Yesterday salat, today eating food that is halal. The third trait. Washkuru lillah. Cultivate within yourselves the habit of being grateful. Shukr. Grateful towards your Lord and grateful to the other human beings around you in whatever capacity it might be the concept of shukr being a person who is grateful actually protects you from being a person who is arrogant and obviously ungrateful the opposite of grateful but arrogance you know this one piece of food that we eat you look at the hadith the importance of saying bismillahir rahmanir rahim before you eat the importance of saying alhamdulillah after you eat these are not lessons that are supposed to be restricted to the akhlaq book of children in the madrasa who are the age of two or three abadan la in fact it is more applicable on us human beings adults it's applicable more on us adults you know this one morsel of food that we eat God forbid, God forbid, if you were not in a position to digest it, can you imagine the chaos your health could be in? Do we ever think about this, this iftar that I've just eaten today? Ya Allah, not only thank you for this food, Ya Allah, thank you for giving me a body that I'm able to digest this food. Seriously, sit back and think, what would be our state if we were not able to digest the food that we consume? We could earn in our professions. We could be successful businessmen. We could be successful engineers, doctors, pilots, whatever you want. But if Allah willed for that crop to not grow from that earth and from that soil, your purchasing power would mean zero. Sahil Allah. appreciating this every time food is in front of you this is why asraf is a concept that is aslan rebuked shias of ali can't do asraf even grain of rice you can't do asraf ni'mah of allah requires shukr and i end with this and then they will have the masaib tayyib Allah says in the Quran, do shukr. For your risk, be thankful. For the risk that we consume and the bounties that we have, are you supposed to thank only Allah? Abadan la. Together with shukr of Allah, it is your responsibility. Your spiritual responsibility to thank Ahlul Bayt for every morsel of risk that you consume. And from Ahlul Bayt, Habibi, it is your responsibility after every meal to thank Imam Al Hussein. This reality, just nobody gets scared that we are talking shirk, huh? This is a reality which is outlined in the ziyara that we read for Imam al Hussein. There are multiple ziyaras that have been narrated by Ahlul Bayt, which we can recite when we go to visit Imam al Hussein. This is one of the ziyarat. It is mentioned in the book Kamilu Ziyarat by Ibn Kaulawi. Ibn Kaulawi is one of the asateen, the founding blocks of Tashayyu in the Ghayba of the 12th Imam. In this book, text, classical text, he narrates one hadith 
or one ziyara of Imam al Hussein, which is narrated by Imam al Sadiq, salawatullahi wa salamahu alayhi. Allahumma shalli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. In this hadith, and you see even the way in which this is where fiqh al hadith comes in. The Imam is talking or narrating this ziyara. He's teaching the people how to do the ziyara of Imam al Hussein, but teaching who? Is teaching that khas category of companions who are at a different level of ma'rifah, the likes of Mufaddal ibn Umar. This is the text of the ziyara. When you're standing in front of the dhari of Imam al Hussein, this is what you're saying to Imam al Hussein. Understand the azamah of this Imam al Hussein that we gather and we weep for and we go to visit. Who is this Hussein? You stand in front of the dhari of Imam al Hussein and you're talking to Imam al Hussein directly. Look at what Imam Sadiq teaches us. Say to Imam al Hussein, Wabikum tumbitul ardu, Wabikum tumbitul ardu ashjaraha. It is because of you, Ya Hussein, that the trees even grow from the earth. Wabikum tukhrijul ashjaru athmaraha. It is because of you, Ya Hussein, that even the fruits, they only grow from the trees because of you, Ya Hussein. Wabikum tinzilu sama o kataraha wa rizkaha. It is because of you, Ya Hussein, that the skies open up and the rains fall down. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Imam al Hussein, Imam al Hussein. Today afternoon it rained. Sahih lola. For us it was just about coming out with the umbrella and complaining there was extra traffic. It's the karama of Imam al Hussein on Nairobi today that it rained for these many hours. If we believe in the words of Imam al Sadiq. And which is why you have plenty of ahadith that state that shukr is not only shukr to Allah but shukr to Ahlul Bayt. And this position that is given to Imam al Hussein doesn't mean that we have stripped anything away from Allah. La, this is a misunderstanding of Allah. If you feel that Allah is threatened by this position of Imam al Hussein, we have to rethink of our position of Tawheed. This is a position given to Imam al Hussein by Allah Azza wa Jal. Our connection with Imam al Hussein is our salvation. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Laylatul Jum'ah, Ahibai, Thursday night is the night of Imam al Hussein and the night of Karbala. And a night that cannot be complete without the remembrance of the tragedy of Karbala. The narrations mention Sham e Gariban, Sham e Gariban. One of the most difficult nights that fell upon the women and the family of Ahlul Bayt. The narrations mention that as Imam Al Hussein was martyred and his body was trampled, Shimr bin Dil Joshan Al Lain cried out to the army together with Omar bin Sa'ad. These are the tents of Hussein, so let us loot them and let us plunder them of all their belongings. The narrations mention that the horsemen in their thousands Thousands went towards the tents of Imam al Hussein on their horses, and the women were filled with fear and terror. Omar ibn Sa'ad lit the tents. Lit, Omar ibn Sa'ad lit the tents on fire. The narrations mentioned that the women started running from one tent to another. Allahu Akbar. Sakin or Sukaina, one of the daughters of Imam al Hussein, says, "As I came running out of a burning tent." I was counted by one of the enemies on the horses. When he saw me running, he hit me with a spear on my head. Sayyida Umm Kulthum says the manner in which he hit Sukaina, he hit her so hard she fainted out of the pain. Allahu Akbar, the women's possessions are stolen and looted. They are being beaten and running in every direction. In all this chaos, the young daughter of Imam al 
Hussein by the name of Sakina, who is known as Rokaya. Sakina is running between the burning tents, crying out, Where is my father, Hussein? Allah, Hamid bin Muslim says that I saw this young girl, Sakina. She was running across the Maidan in Karbala. Her little dress, her dress was on fire. Allah, Hamid bin Muslim says, I went running behind the girl and I put the fire off her dress. This girl was absolutely terrified. She raised her hands towards me and she said, Oh man, do not hit me. Oh man, do not take anything. I don't have anything remaining. This is the Yatima, Yatima of Imam Al Hussein. Huh? They say that when a girl, when a parent, when a parent or a father or a mother dies, treat the child with gentleness treat the child with compassion but how did they treat the yatims of hussein allah baby sakina said the sakina raises her hand she says oh man do not hit me the man says i shall not hit you she says to him oh man can i ask you a question he says what she says to him oh man show me the direction to najaf he says oh little girl and what will you do when you go to najaf sakina cried out and she said oh man my father father used to say if you are ever in difficulty we have a grandfather in Najaf Mushkil Khusha cry out Ya Ali Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah Allahumma inna nasaluka bihaqi Sayyida Sakina by the wasila of Sayyida Sakina. Ya Allah hasten the reappearance of Imam al Hujjah. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the sake of Sayyida Sakina, Ya Allah, accept our fast and our a'mal on a night like this. Ya Allah, by the sake of Sayyida Sakina, forgive us our sins on a night like this. By the sake of Sayyida Sakina, Ya Allah, Mu'mineen and Mu'minat who have come here today, do not let anybody leave except that you have fulfilled their hajat, Ya Allah. By the sake of Sayyida Sakina, Mu'mineen and Mu'minat who are not in the best of health, Ya Allah, you grant them shafa. Ya Allah, by the sake of Sayyida Sakina, Marhumin and Marhumat who have passed away, you make their graves into a garden from the gardens of Jannah. Wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen yakulu Allah ta'ala inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima.